Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have a lot to do. I've already spent, I'm guessing, about 30 cycles preparing for this episode before I even hit record. Because today we're going to another planetoid and we're getting some space lettuce. The whole reason we want space lettuce is because we want frost burgers. Lucky for us, Aquazon is only about three and a half tiles away. So the trip to get there is not going to be too bad. Once we get there, we're going to have to do the whole rover and dupe, build a rocket platform, and then we're going to go dig out and try to find some more water weed. There is one seed here and a couple over here, but I'd prefer not to make this trip and do all this work only to bring home a few pieces of water weed. Because based on how slow water weed grows, it's going to take a while, especially considering we're leaving them wild. And the reason why we're going to have the pips plant them wild is because domesticated water weeds take more than we have to be able to maintain. To include 500 grams per cycle of bleachstone and some salt water. But when you're done, you're going to be given 4,800 calories worth of lettuce. The only good news is, being that it gives you 4,800 calories worth of lettuce, it makes the math kind of easy because it takes water weed 48 cycles to grow which means we can expect about 100 calories worth of lettuce per cycle per plant. And with every frost burger requiring 400 calories, that means every frost burger being wild grown is going to require four plants. And I think we're going to be shooting for four frost burgers per cycle, which means we'll need 16 wild planted water weed seeds. So step one was getting the logistical wanderer 15 prepared for its maiden voyage. Do me a favor, leave a better name down in the comments, and I'll pick the best one and we'll go with that. And no, we're not naming it the Weed Wagon. We actually only have one last thing to build in here, and that is the Atmosu checkpoint. And as previously discussed, we have been preparing HP Fangirl for an upcoming mission, and I figured this one fits the bill. This dupe is great because they have three different interests in researching, cooking, and digging, but we're mostly going to be concerned with the digging and the researching. And putting two points into digging, two points into research, and one into rocket piloting only gave them a morale need of seven. Well, that's not a problem for this rocket layout, because we have a great haul and a bedroom. Not to mention the fact they're going to be eating berry sludge, which provides even more morale, so HP Fangirl is going to be doing just fine. While we let the dupes do the finishing touches on that rocket, I wanted to show you an update that I had done, where I inadvertently learned something new about oxygen not included. I was all proud of myself for an idea that I had that, hey, why don't we add a couple more solar panels in this beautiful blank spot right here? I mean, look how nicely they would fit. Unfortunately, it was not going to work out. But instead of testing this out, First, I went ahead and upgraded the entire stable to glass window tiles, thinking that the light would shine through and then hit my two beautifully placed solar panels. Unfortunately, what I learned today was apparently gases can stop light. And by gases, I specifically mean carbon dioxide. My theory is that carbon dioxide actually blocks more light than, say, oxygen. You can see here the 1000 lux coming off of the printing pod is doing just fine going through all this oxygen. There's no specific statement about light blocking effect in the gases panel. There's nothing about it in the light entry of the database, so I can't find any sort of explanation of why this occurs. I started thinking that maybe it was just the slicksters being the little voidlings that they are. But when we look at the light overlay, even on the tiles where there is no slicksters, all the light's still being blocked. So let me know if you found any sort of reference material concerning this effect, because I'd be interested to see whether or not it's just carbon dioxide that blocks light, or is it only because it's going through so many tiles of carbon dioxide? I don't know. But seriously, look how nice the solar panels would have looked there. Of course, it could always be a bug. This here is Queen Calero trying to put on her suit, and they've been trying for about a third of a cycle. It is an adorable animation, but eventually we gotta let Queen Calero eat and go to the bathroom. So we'll end their madness by assigning them their suit directly. Uh, apparently that's not working either. What if we try to move Calero? Okay, something's borked. What if we try deconstructing the Atmosu checkpoint? Okay, we're in serious trouble here. Let me try a quick reload. Well, that appears to have worked, and Calero is now in their suit, except apparently they need to make a phone call. Now that everybody's out of the rocket that's supposed to be out of the rocket, let's go ahead and crew it up. But there's one quick test I'm going to want to make before I go off on this mission. You see, we're only taking Fangirl. 
because my theory is I should be able to go to orbit, put Fangirl inside the Trailblazer module, and then have the rocket automatically land on the planetoid. So first, we're going to actually test this out. And I'm going to consider this an acceptable reason to save scum if it does not work. Because, you know, we're testing, right? For our test, we're just going to go right to orbit. Oh, that would have been bad. <laughs> I was getting ready to acknowledge the warnings. And apparently one of our landers is not ready. And it's because... Despite there being 400 kilos worth of steel inside the Trailblazer module and Rover's lander being full up and ready to go, apparently because they can't reach the storage? I don't know. We'll put a ladder there just to make sure everything's on the up and up. If I were to guess, they're going to take this steel and construct a lander out of it. Never really realized that it wasn't just dropping off materials, but they actually had to build something in addition to the Trailblazer module itself. And there it is. Trailblazer Lander. Learning new things all over this episode. With the warnings gone, we can begin our launch sequence. Also of note, because this has come up quite a few times in the past few episodes, you'll notice that their range remaining is already 19 tiles. But now let's try this out. I really should have saved again after we did all that work to the lander. We'll make sure Fangirl is in their suit. And before they have an opportunity to hang it back up, we'll head out to the star map. Put them inside the Trailblazer module and deploy it. Oh, this is going to be kind of cool. We're going to be able to have a little Trailblazer module sitting here. Perfect. I wish I would have figured this out earlier because I'd have all my spaceports having a Trailblazer lander sitting there. It's a nice little decoration at a minimum. Now it's time to see if the rocket will land here. Will you look at that? So why did we do all this testing? Well, because now we know we only have to send one dupe on these missions. So once a new lander has been built and we're topped off with Oxalite, we'll get this mission underway. As Fangirl heads to the rocket, I figured I'd give you another update on the colony itself. During the daytime, we have a decent amount of power, but at night, when we lose access to all the beautiful solar panels, we're starting to experience some brownouts. We're taking a few steps to mitigate that. First, we upgraded the rest of the coolant loops to super coolant, which should make the thermo aqua tuners jobs a little bit easier, hence they won't have to work as much, saving us a little bit of power. We're also taking in mind when we're creating oxalite, we were just creating it flat out, but now I'm just keeping about five tons in stock. And then finally, we put an automation switch on the Rad Bull generators. Right now, we have five tons of diamond, all thanks to our wonderful little diamond press. But do I really need more than five tons of diamond? Not really. But this is only temporary, because I know exactly what the doctor ordered for more power. That's right, we're gonna put in another plug slug farm. It's gonna take a little bit of work. I'm gonna have to squish all of this over. This water is what's supplying our rocket interiors. And then since I already have this set up, I figure we'll just connect them right about here with an airflow tile. So all the hydrogen will naturally head up that way anyways. And while this colony has left me wanting for more space and maybe some water would have been nice. The one thing it does have in spades is plenty of metal volcanoes. In fact, when we add up the average output for all six of these volcanoes, we're getting almost two kilos per second worth of metal. And two plug slug ranches only requires 1.6 kilos per second. So we're gonna be able to afford two plug slug ranches and still have an infinite supply of metal. So we're gonna have no problem feeding a second ranch full of plug slugs. And then there's gonna be no way we have power problems, right? Step one is going to be moving all this water over here. I figure this is a good enough spot. And then we'll move the pump over to keep supplying our rocket program with all the water it needs. We are now in orbit of Aquazon, so it's time to get Fangirl in their suit. It has 85% durability, so that should be fine. Fingers crossed. First thing, we'll deploy Rover's module. This looks like the perfect position here. And of course, I just realized I didn't actually have to deploy Rover's module because there's already steel here because we've already had a Rover here. I guess two Rovers are better than one. And then we'll land the dupe right next to Rover. Well, here goes nothing. Look at this. We just got a big old happy family here. The one disadvantage of sending Fangirl out on their first mission is they haven't done a lot of building. So their construction skills are literally zero. Not that it's a big deal because we have plenty of time, but perhaps I should have put them through some temperature shift plate building exercises. Yeah, I'm pretty happy that we landed both Rover and Fangirl because while the dupe's building the rocket platform, old Rover's building the ladders. And now all we have to do is land the rocket. One thing that I just got lucky on 
because I didn't check it, was to make sure we had enough ceiling height here. Uh, you might want to move. This is going to be a little warm. Oh yeah, that can't be good. I think we're going to gobble up a bunch of this fossil and take it home with us too. Let's go ahead and empty out the oxalite from the container, and then we're going to pick up fossil and all the water weed seed we can find. Well, at least 18 of them, because that's all the room we have. This mission's going off without a hitch. Look, I'm just as surprised as you are. The rocket's working out well. They have all the berry sludge they could ever want. Our oxygen and filtration system works great. We even put in the gas vent. That way the carbon dioxide is not stuck in the spacefare module while we're landed. This whole rocket I'm pretty happy with. We managed to put three solar panel modules on it and an artifact transport module. I wonder if you need a drill cone to be able to use the artifact transport module. And it says it only holds artifacts found in space, but I'm pretty confident we'd be able to put one of the artifacts that we find here on the ground in there. Of course, we could just build a pedestal and not have to worry about it. Now, we've queued up a bunch of digging commands, and they're eventually going to get around to this. But at a minimum, I'd like to explore this entire planetoid and make sure that we put down our wonderful mini pod. I just gotta decide where I want to put it. Now, other than the water weed seed and possibly some of that fossil, there's not much that we're going to expect to find an Aquazon. It does have three nice water vents, so colonization here wouldn't be too difficult. But interestingly enough, there's also a radioactive biome, which means bees and a whole lot of uranium. As if we didn't have enough critters on this colony, I had another wonderful idea. We're going to start taking the shine nymph eggs when we see them in the printing pod. And then we're going to drop them off right here in this automatic dispenser, in which they will be trapped in this area here, providing us even more light. Now, it doesn't make a huge difference, but every little bit counts, right? Not that power is going to be a big deal for very much longer, because the second plug slug ranch is coming online. We're also making some decent progress over here on Aquazon. We started grabbing poke shell molts as well because there's a lot of them hanging around. But we're up to 13 water weed seeds and over 2 tons of fossil. I've also been going around digging up some of these tiles here that have the buried objects because a lot of times they hold water weed seeds as well. I don't think we're going to be able to explore the entire planetoid because this seems to be one of the larger planetoids. You can see right here where the mouse flips over on the unknown, which makes this planetoid about this big. So we may not get to see any bees after all. I know. Sad potatoes. Well, we now have 100% of the seeds we need. We have the mini pod on the planetoid. We did manage to do a little bit more of exploring. Sadly, still no bees. We did uncover a Gravitas monument, that'd be kind of cool to see, and there's a couple of vents and geysers. We're going to take a quick look at this, and then I think it'll be time for us to leave. On our home planetoid, power is no longer an issue. We now are running 16 plug slugs. Absolutely glorious. The second stable is pretty similar to the first, although it's got a slightly better footprint, and we only require one auto sweeper to reach everywhere. Because we already had the gas pump up here for the hydrogen collection, we didn't really need to put a roof up here, so we just added a layer of airflow tiles. That way the hydrogen has a place to go up until it makes its way over. It does a decent job, and as the oxygen pressure fluctuates, so does the hydrogen levels. But there's so little hydrogen that none of our plug slugs have any chance of laying a smog slug egg. I am keeping an eye on the battery levels, because when those plug slugs go to sleep, it generates a lot of power. Exhibit A. And we still have a couple of babies here, so when they grow up, it's even going to be more. And you'll notice our battery box here is capped out, as is all of our overflow batteries inside of our industrial sauna. So we need to add some more batteries. And I would just expand our battery box, but I really love our battery meter, and I don't want to mess with it. You know, I suppose we could put the battery meter inside the battery box. Give me a quick minute. Actually, I think I just had a better idea. Let's go ahead and pave paradise and put up a parking lot, huh? Now that's a battery box. Except, it's still not enough batteries. We're still pinging out at 20 kilojoules, thanks to our beautiful friends, the plug slugs. I may have to build another battery box, but I think this is going to be good for now. Meanwhile, the horribly named Logistical Wanderer 15 has returned, which means it's time for us to start planting waterweed seeds. 
Now this is going to take a little while, and it would be 48 cycles before we'd actually see any results anyways. So I'm going to show you the rest of the logistics behind our new Frost Burger meals. We used to make all the berry sludge over here on Frostalin, and it was convenient. They would go grab all the sleet wheat and bristle berries and throw it in the micro musher. I think Jay Ray just salted their berry sludge. You can't salt your berry sludge, Jay Ray. But now we've set up a rail system to where all the sleet wheat and the bristle berries are sent directly to our home planetoid. Here they ride the rail directly into the deep freezer where we are loading all the sleet wheat in between this micro musher and this conveyor loader. The sleet wheat that's in the conveyor loader is sent to this conveyor receptacle where we make our frost buns. The frost buns are then sent right back into the deep freezer where along with the barbecue and eventually the lettuce will then be pulled out to make the frost burgers. Now the natural gas wasn't a problem. If you remember, we have a fairly robust natural gas system here and we've just split it off from there where of course we have a buffer tank that'll keep our gas range supplied through the dormancy periods. And with the assistance of the PIP, who I'm hoping will eventually collaborate and start planting some water weed seeds, we'll then collect all that lettuce using auto sweepers and conveyor loaders to where we'll send all that lettuce to the deep freezer. So in about 50 or 60 cycles, we'll finally be eating some frost burgers. And our first water weed seed is in, and thus begins more time that I'll be spending off camera. I hope you enjoyed this episode and our mission for space lettuce, and I'm sorry we weren't able to actually produce any fresh frost burgers today, but at least you know that they're coming. Frost burgers check. Next up, thermium. And that is what we'll be concentrating on next week. So until then, I'll talk to you soon.